know, where there's an event, you know, uh, being run by the Caribbean African Health Network based in Great Manchester, but working with the community right across the UK and beyond. And, and this morning, once again, we're delighted to come back to the most important topic at the moment in many of our living rooms and via the various WhatsApp platforms and social media, talking about the vaccine. Two weeks ago, we held a similar event and we were you know, well aware that we've not been able to answer all the questions. The event, interim event report, will be going out ho hopefully by tomorrow with some of the questions answered. But we understand, you know, we need more than just one single event to address all the concerns. So once again, this morning, we're delighted to have Black, you know, health professionals and practitioners in our midst to, you know, make a presentation, answer questions and offer some reassurance really you know, to those who consent. And I'm very delighted that we have our volunteer medical lead, Dr. Ngozi Adiosagi, you know, to facilitate this session. So I'll hand over to Dr. Ngozi, who is going to, you know, introduce the guest speakers and then facilitate our session. Please, throughout the conversation or throughout the session, you can use the chat box after the presentation. We'll be taking questions you know, so you can put your questions in the chat box. We also welcome those who've joined us on, you know, YouTube Live and Facebook Live. Please use the chat box, put your questions there, and we have the current staff team who will be monitoring. So just the last thing to say is this session is more of an information and, you know, kind of awareness session. We're not here to coerce anyone. We want to give people as much objective information as possible to help each and everyone make informed decision about whether to receive the vaccine when they are offered or not. So that's purely what this session is all about. So at this point in time, I want to hand over to Dr. Ngozi Adiosagi. I've seen someone raise their hand already and we'll come back to you, but we need to, you know, get through the presentation and then we'll take a couple of questions. So over to you, Dr. Ngozi. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for giving up your time to join us once again in our Khan Health Hour. I was a bit blown away a couple of weeks ago when we had our session where we attracted over 1,500 people. But what that told me was that there was still a need for information. The people logged in because they wanted to know, they wanted more information to enable them to make an informed decision. And I think Charles is quite right to say that this is not a, um, a session where we're here to coerce. What we want is to be able to, put, to provide um, our community and colleagues and friends and family with information that they can go away and make the choice for themselves. So because we had, a, th th that session was great, but um, we thought it would, was um, a good idea to have another session where we'd have a bit more of an intimate, um, less people. It was very difficult to address the concerns of over 1,500 people at the time. Um, and we know that there were lots of unanswered questions. So this session is a follow-up session to that. Um, we try and gear these sessions to the needs of the community. And the fact is that you wanted more information. That's why we're here today. So I am delighted to welcome some of my colleagues. Um, so Dr. Ugo Madi is a, a GP who works in Bolton. He specializes in the provision of services relating to diagnostic and screening procedures for family planning, maternity and midwifery services. And um, when his surgery was inspected by the QC, CQC, it came out as being good. So he's a GP to, um, if you're living in that area, someone to register with. Dr. Quincy Chuka is a GP in Warrington, Cheshire. And he actually has a way of really collaborating with um, clinical services. And um, I quote that he said that one of the things that he would like to do is look at collaborative changes in the way we deliver care for our patients and encourage them to think differently about their own personal care. Dr. Deji Adedeye is a GP in Salford. And in 2019, he contributed to the Still I Rise event, which celebrates black, Asian and minority ethnic culture in Salford and tells the story of some of those who work in the city's public and voluntary sectors. And lastly, we've got Dr. Joel Paul, who's a consultant virologist in the Northern Care Alliance. He's a clinical lead for virology. And recently the virology service at Oldham Hospital run a, won a Royal College of Pathologists Achievement Award 
for innovation in practice in, 19, in 2020. So I'm delighted to welcome the panel today. And they're going to start off with some presentations and then we will facilitate, I will facilitate questions after that. So thank you very much. Hello, um, thank you Ngozi uh, for that. I, um, myself and my colleagues, uh, Dr. Uh, Deji Adeye and Dr. Quincy Kuchuka, uh, like Ngozi said, will be uh, starting off by uh, doing a presentation, which I will do, and then we will all take questions. Um, so I'm going to, Start sharing my screen. Give me one moment. And Baron, any. Are you able to? Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen, Ugo. Okay. Um, right, so what I'm going to do uh, in starting this, so sometimes I get this hiccup, I hope it moves when I move it. Okay, I'm gonna move it myself, sorry. So what we are going to do is to start by just talking about the vaccine. Why do we vaccinate? Why do we need to do that at all? And I will, um, me and my colleagues will, I'll speak to you from the point of view of a general practitioner. I know that somebody who knows this a lot more than me is coming behind me. Uh, we have a virologist in the house, but this is just the way a GP uh, perspective and a, just a general approach to, to, to these. So why do we vaccinate at all? But I, I think it's important for us to start asking the question about immunity. Uh, there are two types of immunity. The one which is inherent in us, which we have because we have skin, which we have because we have other systems that prevent uh, diseases from coming in. But then we have the acquired immunity, uh, which is what happens when we come across anything foreign. So that thing foreign is called an antigen. An antigen can be anything in the form of a virus or a parasite, be it malaria, be it anything whatsoever, that's an antigen. And when that comes into contact with our body, our body has a complex system of interaction uh, between all the defense systems in our body. So they are basically called the B cells and the T cells. I think it's just sufficient to just to name them B cells and T cells. These will package the, uh, the antigen and begin to mount uh, defense against this antigen that comes in contact with us. During that process, the body then gets memory. So they package this and they wait. Because they've got contact with this antigen, they build, we have memory cells. So these memory cells are within our immune system, within these B cells and T cells. What then happens is that they are then quicker to respond in the future should there be any further insult from any antigen or infection. Now, this memory and this acquired immunity is modified by different things which we call comorbidities. So that is whether it's dependent on whether the age and dependent on whether you've got diabetes, depending on whether you have obesity. Now, why is this important? I think this will, we will get to look at this later, why we should actually, uh, why this is a part of uh, a very important thing in terms of who is vulnerable to COVID. And when we vaccinate people, the whole essence of the vaccination is that we want to bring them in contact with an antigen without actually causing disease. And during this process as well, we again introduce something and then the body begins to mount an 
uh, immune response against that. And within that period, these same memory cells that we mentioned before are built again, such that when in the future that comes a disease or anything else that is related to that vaccination, then we are able to mount the protection. Now, this response is the same in all human beings, irrespective of whether you're Caucasian or you're Black or your Asian or all people. As far as the UK is concerned, within this country, when it comes to making vaccines, there's the medicines and healthcare and, and health uh, um, regulatory agencies is the one who gets license for that. And there's also the Joint Commission for Vaccination and Immunization, which advises about the effectiveness of vaccines. So basically, they have to make sure that every vaccine is safe and effective before they are licensed for use. And the whole point of COVID vaccination is that the people who are most at risk are the people who are being targeted. Now, just to come to the COVID vaccine itself, we want to know, there has been questions about what's in the vaccines. And I think that the best way to say it is that uh, the, the, the recurring thing there, when you think about COVID vaccines, is about spike, spike protein. Now, there are two main vaccines which have been licensed in the UK. There's the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer-BioNTech. So talking about the AstraZeneca to start with, which is the one in collaboration with Oxford, What's happening there, if you can see that on that picture, the, the red bit is the, is the spike protein. And what is happening is that with the AstraZeneca vaccine, they have taken a, 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 a spike protein and inserted it into another virus, which is called an adenovirus, which is a very, very weakened virus. And it's injected into that adenovirus to make the vaccine. So when it's injected into our body, the, 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 the message within that virus goes into our body and our body begins to make the spike protein. And it is that spike protein which the body immune system recognizes and begins to build immune attack against it. Just like I was saying in the previous slide, and within this period as well, the body begins to make memory cells against that. So again, we have the B cells and the T cells. I think it's sufficient to just call them that, but they are a part of this immune response that we're talking about. So after some time, if the patient now gets the second dose, an even greater immune response is mounted so that Anytime this patient or any person comes into contact with the coronavirus, that S protein, uh, which is in the coronavirus is recognized. And that is how the COVID vaccine works uh, with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And then the, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is, again, is about spike protein as well. What's happening there is that the, the messenger RNA, which is the, the, the small sequence that makes the S uh, protein in the uh, virus is taken and is wrapped in some lipid that is a fat material. And that is what this nanoparticle that you hear about. I mean, if you have cousins or anybody who from QAnon and they're talking about nanoparticles, that's all that it is, just a lipid that wraps around the virus. And the main reason for that is for it to be able to penetrate the cell when the, the virus to, to be injected. That's what nanoparticle is. So they wrap it around and then when it's injected uh, into the body, it then triggers the body to make this spike protein again. 
So this spike protein looks exactly like the spike protein of the coronavirus. So the body then begins to mount an immune system so that anytime anything that's got that spike protein comes along, it gets attacked. That is how we then build immunity against a coronavirus by these two vaccines. So you'd see that there's something common in, in both of them. At some point, as soon as the spike protein is made, the two vaccines are the same. Now, the, with, this, with the BioNTech uh, vaccine, the response is made in about 21 days. That's the zero conversion. And after about when you have the second dose, it's about 99%, 95% effective. And for the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, it's 70% effective, but the, uh, the information is that the longer it takes in between the vaccines, the more effective it is. So when you come to your GP or when you go to the vaccine center for a vaccine, the, the very important thing is that we need consent and consenting to the vaccine is about understanding it. So we want to uh, give you all the information you need and you have opportunity to ask questions uh, about the vaccine. And um, in most cases, uh, your, the person giving you the vaccine will be answered the questions that you need. The cold chain is ensured, very important. We, if, if the vaccine is outside the range, it doesn't get uh, injected in you. So it must be, for the AstraZeneca, it must be done within six hours. We usually check the vial to make sure that there are no debris and uh, definitely there are no microchips there. Um, it's given inside the muscle just so that there will be better response. And when you've had the vaccine, you will have an information leaflet given to you. There should not be driving. If with the Pfizer BioNTech, you're supposed to sit around for about 15 minutes afterwards. And it's not the same with the AstraZeneca, but for both vaccines, you should not be driving for the first 15 minutes. And then information gets given to your GP. Um, who should not have the vaccine? There is only very, very few situations where you should never have the vaccine. And that is if you have had a confirmed uh, episode of very severe allergy reaction, which is called anaphylaxis. It's, it's such that you require uh, having an adrenaline injection. If you have had that to that particular vaccine, or if you are known to have had a multiple, uh, 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 that type of allergy to multiple medications. If you are unwell in yourself, especially if you're running temperature, you should not have the vaccine at that particular time. And the reason is that it will just confuse uh, everybody with regards to, are you having the, the temperature because you've had the vaccine or because you've got something else? There's Information coming out about pregnancy, about whether pregnant people can have it. I think we had a session uh, last uh, week regarding this, um, but the, the information right now is that it's not routinely given to pregnant people, but if you're pregnant and you have it inadvertently, it wouldn't change anything. You don't have to go have a termination because of that or because you're worried that something will happen to your baby. And if you're trying to conceive, you can still have the vaccine. It doesn't stop you having the vaccine. If you're breastfeeding, it's okay to have the vaccine. In people who are immunocompromised, they still have to have the vaccine, but they, they still need to continue to take precautions. Uh, that is the social distancing, the face mask wearing, because how much immune system that they muster uh, is still uh, not very defined, especially uh, especially with HIV and people on uh, chemotherapy and immunosuppression. What happens when you've had the vaccine? Uh, it may be just local. Most people will have local reaction. I have had my two vaccines. Um, 
All I, in, when I had my first vaccine, I didn't even notice anything. When I had my second vaccine, I had some swelling on my arm and that was about it. So, but swelling or um, redness may happen in the area or all over, you may just feel tired or headache, feverishness, aches and pains may happen. Particularly people who are on blood thinning medications, uh, if you're on warfarin or other medications that thin the blood, like we call them apixaban and similar medications, they can still have it, except that they have to put, there has to be extra pressure on there because um, there's a higher risk of bleeding and the injection goes right into the muscle. Uh, there's definitely no racial profiling as far as myself and my colleagues here are concerned. I think as far as UK is concerned, we give the same vaccine to everybody. There is no, there is no mixture. Again, this is regarding a lot of things out there. So we want to put the record straight about who gets what. Um, well, you definitely won't grow a tail and you won't grow a horn and you won't become an imbecile. In fact, just three days ago, one of my uh, cancer patients came in and uh, I introduced talking about the vaccine. She said, no, no, no way. They're not going to have it because it will make them an imbecile. So there are still a lot of information like this out there, which we need to, you know, um, look at it the right way around, the more uh, correct information. MRHA uh, continues to gather data about any side effects that may happen. MRHA is the regulatory agency that you know, licenses all medications. Well, lastly, um, I would say that the question is COVID vaccination, COVID treatment, I think that they are part of the same coin, really, uh, because they are still the, the issue of dexamethasone, heparin, azithromycin, it's all been mentioned. People with uh, regarding vitamin D, uh, ivermectin is the latest one on the news, which everybody is hearing, but they are in vitro studies. So there's still more research being awaited. Our people like using herbs, and uh, it is true that there are some herbs which have immunosuppressant activity or immunostimulant activity, but they are not really an alternative to vaccine. Um, and uh, whether we are all going to wait to have the vaccine or whether we are going to wait and come in contact with COVID and then wait for immune system. Uh, again, that's the information we need to uh, look at because based on the studies, people who have had the vaccine mount a lot, lot more immunity than people who have actually had COVID. And um, that's, the, uh, that's the final point uh, from me on that. And uh, thank you very much. We can take questions. Hey, Dr. Ugo, that was really, really interesting um, because I think there has been, there, there have, I haven't seen a lot of forums where they've gone into the detail about what's in the vaccine and how it gets our body to respond. So I think a lot of our, um, the people who have logged in today will have found that very helpful. So there have been a number of questions in the chat. And before I go to your colleagues, so Dr. Chuka and um, uh, and Dr. Dele, are you going to are you going to do a presentation? Or are you going to answer help to answer some of the questions? What they they will have the answer video? questions. Okay, mostly. excellent. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to start addressing some of the questions that are in the chat. Um, could you stop screen sharing? I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you. I have to. But I found that really helpful. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to, there, there are a number of questions on a particular theme. So I'm going to take them as the, the themes that are coming up. So one of them says, I've had flu and I've had pneumonia. Um, should I take the vaccine? Yes, definitely. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to get this to come off. Now, technical hitch. How do I take that off? It's not coming off, apologies. 
my screen sharing. Oh, thank you. If you have had, if you have had COVID and you have had pneumonia, you can definitely still have the COVID vaccine. Uh, like we were saying, the amount of uh, protection which is mounted by the body from having COVID uh, is much, much less than the protection which the vaccine gives. So for that reason, it's still a lot more protective. And the fact that the COVID vaccine is done twice uh, actually continues, it boosts the, the, the immune protection a lot more because of the memory cells that we were talking about. So definitely. Okay. So what I'm, I'm going to do is, um, there, is a number, there are a number of questions about immunosuppression. And I'm going to ask um, Dr. Paul, would you like to um, answer those questions on immunosuppression and the vaccine? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I was trying to unmute myself, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, the host had to unmute me. So thanks for that. Um, interesting. And thank you so much, Dr. Hugo. That was a, a very brief and uh, uh, very succinct presentation. Um, before I go to the immunosuppression, can I quickly mention about the flu vaccine and the pneumonia vaccine, Dr. Hugo? Yes, okay with yes yeah. please. So one of the most important things that as a virologist and uh, who makes sure that we, we ensure the proper vaccines for our hospital patients, our staff and the community GPs is to make sure that they get the right uh, vaccines at the right time with the right dose. And one of the key things to remember is that all these vaccines, when they're studied, one of the key factors they study is to see whether any other vaccines or any other drugs or anything else will cross react with that. I can assure you that uh, the flu vaccine and the pneumonia vaccine will not cross react. Having said that, the national recommendation from JCBI and others is to make sure that if you have had a flu jab, um, you have to make sure that you're given at least a week after the flu jab, a minimum. Ideally, I would recommend two weeks. Leave two weeks after your flu jab or your pneumonia jab and then take the COVID vaccine. So that's, that's the first answer. With regards to the immunocompromised patients and the different groups, immunocompromised patients, we have broadly people who are very severely immunosuppressed or those who are moderately immunosuppressed. And um, if I try to make it simple for you, the way to look at it is that somebody who has undergone a stem cell bone marrow transplant, for example, or a solid organ transplant, will be under the highest possible immunosuppression because they've had a new organ or a new uh, blood uh, trans uh, tra transplant which means that the immunosuppressive drugs that has to be given to manage that will keep them very immunosuppressed. Uh, whereas the others, like for example, somebody who's a well-controlled HIV infection or uh, somebody who's on uh, chemotherapy, uh, has had chemotherapy six months ago and things so that are sort of moderately immunosuppressed. And the reason I'm telling this is specifically because I think there were some questions about lupus vulgaris and there was questions about SLE and lots of other things. Now, the, these are people who will have uh, enough uh, immune uh, cells and immune response to any antigen. So like Dr. Hugo mentioned, uh, the, uh, the whole purpose of the vaccine is to make sure that you trigger your body to produce protective T cells, which will fight against the virus, as well as antibodies. Yeah. So all those groups of patients that that we classify as immunosuppressed uh, and not severely immunosuppressed will mount those responses. So the answer is absolutely yes, they have to get it. So then we have this group which is critically or severely immunosuppressed. The problem is not about giving the vaccine because the vaccine itself will not cause any harm to them at all. Yeah. The concern is whether they will mount a very good antibody response or not. So far from the initial studies done with the Moderna, with the Pfizer, with the Oxford AstraZeneca and the Novavax and the Janssen and all of the vaccines that are being used globally, there seems to be a protective effect uh, with the vaccine, even in those groups. And the reason I say that is because 
the vaccine studies that have been done so far have all been only to look at two key factors, which is if I took the vaccine and waited for the time period for the body to produce those cells, i.e. 10 days to 14 days after having had the vaccine, what are the chances of me dying if I took the vaccine or if I don't take the vaccine? And the answer is that it definitely has got an advantage even in the immunosuppressed patients. So the answer is that the vaccine uh, studies that have been done have been done to make sure that our most vulnerable patients, so more than 80 year olds, immunosuppressed patients, uh, people with um, you know uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension, chronic respiratory disease and all those things, whether this vaccine will make sure that people don't die or land up in a hospital, needing hospital oxygen, ICU care, and things like that. And the answer is yes to that. So all groups of patients, except the group that we discussed, uh, Dr. Hugo kindly put it up on the slides, are the people who have definitely got a known anaphylaxis, uh, i.e. a severe allergic reaction to these vaccines. Uh, and the pregnancy discussion is still debatable. The answer is that I do know some colleagues who are doctors who have chosen to take it. The reason is that compared to all other vaccines that, uh, we, that we can give to pregnant women, this vaccine is relatively safe. It doesn't contain any live virus. So that's the most important thing. And the second thing is that uh, so far from multiple studies done anywhere, it hasn't shown any kind of uh, effect on the fetus and things like that. Now, if you take that and compare that with a pregnant lady who has got the COVID-19 infection, I can tell you that even though it has not cost enough, uh, lots of uh, you know, um, uh, abortions or fetal loss and things like that, it has caught a significant effect on the mother itself by getting COVID-19 infection. So personally, if I was a, a, a woman myself and I was pregnant, and if I was asked and I was asked to make a choice, I will take the vaccine. Now, I know I'm not a woman, so it's probably not fair for me to talk on behalf of women. But what I'm trying to get at is the fact that, uh, that the vaccine is safe for use in, in that group as well, is my opinion. Uh, but I would go by the national advice and say that if you're pregnant, you need to uh, you need to make a risk assessment for yourself. For example, if you're pregnant and you're on maternity leave at home, yes, it's worthwhile waiting for some more time and see what studies come out and things like that. If you are pregnant, but you are in, in a situation, unfortunately, that you have to go out and be exposed to lots of people uh, uh, in your, that situation, your risk of getting COVID-19 infection and having serious effects because of that versus taking the risk of a remote one in a million possibility, not even one in a million uh, of the vaccine side effect, I would say that uh, is worth taking, in my opinion. So. Uh, I don't want to prolong this too much and make it very simple and answer this school questions. Yes, you have to take the vaccine. I can't say you have to. Yes, I would recommend you take the vaccines, uh, even if you've taken the flu and the pneumonia vaccine, but make sure you take it two weeks, one or two weeks after you had the flu or pneumonia vaccine. For immunosuppressed patients, yes, please take it because you, you, you will need it more than uh, say a young, uh, a young, uh, a young person, uh, a teenager, or, or a young person in comparison, because we know that the maximum amount of um, uh, mortality and severity of this disease is seen in that group, and we know very well that this vaccine definitely protects against those two key factors. And uh, I'm sure we will discuss this later. The important point to remember is that the vaccine is designed to prevent severity and mortality, but not mild infections. So yes, you can still get the vaccine. And yes, you can still, uh, sorry, even if you take the vaccine, yes, you can still get the disease, but you will not land up in a hospital or you won't die because of it in a significant proportion. That's the bottom line. And so I keep telling this to all my junior doctors and nurses in the hospital that no one is safe until all of us are safe. So. The goal is that all of us have to get there with the vaccine. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Paul. I think it's just worth reiterating that the, the key messages from this is that there's a comparison. What you're weighing up is whether you have the vaccine or you, you get the COVID infection. And I know I've heard some people say, I'd rather have the COVID infection and build up your immunity. But the fact is that if you do get COVID, you have no idea of whether you're the person that will end up in ITU or whether the person is going to have a mild infection. 
So that's the, 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 the choices you have to think about when you're deciding to have a vaccine. And Dr. Paul has put that very succinctly and very, very clearly. Um, so some of the other questions that are coming up, and I'm going to give this one to Dr. Dr. Quincy, is, um, is it safe to have the vaccine if you've got underlying health conditions and if you have sickle cell? That's a, that, it, that's a tough one uh, because <clears throat> of, 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 of limited um, um, evidence in the, uh, the uh, trial on people with sickle cell. But it comes back to what Dr. Paul said. It's about understanding your risk and benefit because everything we do is do less harm or do no harm. So uh, I can't, I, I don't know the specifics about sickle cell, but what the bottom line is it, when, when people get COVID, the consequences are pretty severe. And as uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ngozi said that you, you don't know where, whether you're going to be the person that will end up in ITU or you're going to be the person that will just have uh, uh, feel um, a bit of aches and pains and a bit of tiredness and then recover. We just don't know. Now, what people don't talk about a lot is the consequence. So, they so you listen to the news. You, you, uh, you, uh, you, they talk about the infection rate. They talk about the, uh, the death rate. What they don't talk about is people that actually survive, but live with long-term problem from COVID. This, as a GP, that's what I deal with on a, on a daily basis now. So uh, I'll give you an example. Yesterday, a young man, uh, 49, self-employed, uh, didn't believe in COVID at all, uh, and he developed COVID. For the past three weeks, he's not, he cannot get out of bed to brush his teeth. He's so out of breath. Um, he came to a point, he came close to being admitted to hospital, but he didn't get to hospital. But now he, he's struggling to be able to do basic daily activities. Um, he, he, he broke down in tears and, and, and said to me, he wished he had listened and taken the precaution be, be, uh, uh, because he's now thinking, if I'm not able to get up and go and have a shower, how can I go to work? How can I pay for my mortgage? How can I support my family? So this becomes the unintended consequences that people don't think about. Then you talk about the people that go to hospital, survive, maybe go to ICU or not end up in ICU. They, they come out with uh, uh, short-term memory loss. They struggle to do basic things and they have all these conditions. We call it now long COVID. That's the term of the diagnosis, okay? And that is so underreported that it, it's gonna be a huge, huge burden on the NHS. Now, talk about the individual, us. What does it mean for our family, for us as breadwinners? Or, you know, it has a huge consequence. So when you balance this, you think, okay, do I take my chance with this COVID vaccine per se, okay? Or do I take my chance with COVID, okay? And it's for me as a GP, it's quite a simple decision to make. I don't think taking chance with the COVID is the, will be the right way to go. I'll probably have the vaccine because I can see the consequences of people, of what people are suffering from when they've had the COVID. There's still, there's still some, uh, some people that will have it and they, they are okay, but there's a huge majority and you just don't know which category you're gonna fall into. So that's the, my point of view. But when it comes back to the uh, sickle cell, uh, there's no reason or, or, in, or indication why they shouldn't have it. Uh, if, if you can have the normal flu uh, jab and, uh, and pneumonia jab, the COVID vaccine is not a live vaccine, uh, particularly the, uh, the mRNA-based ones. So that's really my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Quincy. That was really helpful. Um, Dr. Deji, some of the questions that have come up have said, I would like to choose which one I take. I've done my research, I've done some reading, I want to choose. Can people choose which um, vaccine they have? 
Well, thank you for that, Ngozi. So yeah, I can I can shed some light on that because I've been doing some uh, sessions in our COVID uh, center in uh, Salford, giving our vaccination to patients. Um, so the, the current uh, practice and guidelines to us is that we are not allowed to give patients the option to choose uh, currently. Um, because what, what's happened is the, the vaccinations are delivered to these centers and sometimes we don't know what is coming in uh, and we've got limited supply, with limited stock of the Oxford vaccine as well as the, um, uh, the, Pfizer, vaccine, uh, the, the Pfizer vaccines. So depending on where you are in the country, uh, that will affect what type of vaccine you get. Uh, and sometimes like, you know, some areas, for example, are using the Oxford vaccine for patients that are housebound who are not able to come to the center uh, because it's more easily, you know, to transport uh, the Oxford vaccine. So unfortunately, the patients are not allowed to choose uh, which vaccine they get. It may be that there might be flexibility further down the year, you know, in a few months when we have more supplies of vaccine, but currently now patients are not allowed to choose uh, which vaccine. Uh, and can I just touch on uh, two things that we, we discussed uh, previously? Uh, one was uh, the Pfizer vaccine as well. Um, so basically, we are doing 12 weeks now. Uh, I, think, I think it was mentioned in this slide that, that you know, it's expected to be taken the second, uh, the second dose expected at uh, 21 days, but in the UK now it is 12 weeks. That is the official government guidance and that's what we are following. And then regarding pregnancy, we are not, we have been told by the government not to give vaccinations to pregnant women. Um, if they've had it, if they've had it and then they are pregnant, then they've been advised to hold off the second vaccination. So currently we are not doing vaccination for pregnant women. Uh, that is the government uh, advice. Thank you very much, Digi. It's it's really, it's it's as you can see, um, to those of you who are listening, the government advice changes on a regular basis as they be, as they come in contact with further information, and so it's up to us health professionals. We have to keep on going and looking at the government guidance. It's changed from the beginning. I've been involved in this in trying to protect my staff and patients. So PP guidance has changed as they become, uh, as they get more information. Um, somebody's made a, a really good point about um, COVID and she felt that perhaps the implication was that you hadn't looked after yourself and that's why you got COVID. Um, I, we understand what we were trying to say. I think the point of the doctor I was trying to say was that um, it wasn't that you didn't look after yourself. It was just that you, you can be exposed. Anybody can be exposed. I've had um, family friends who haven't left their house, but they've obviously they've come in contact with their family members and that's how they've got COVID. Um, and I think the example is just trying to illustrate that um, wherever we are, you can be exposed to COVID and therefore take the, um, one, of the pre one of the things that can help is the vaccine. So I'm going to come to some other questions. So one of the other questions, um, and, and Ugo, you might want to answer this one, is that there are new strains coming out now. And there's ones from South Africa. I think there's one that they're calling a English strain. Um, does the vaccine help to protect from all these new strains? Well, I think that it's a, it's a moving target. Um, is, is, is what I can say about it based on what we know so far, perhaps uh, Dr. Paul will have something to say as well, but based on what we know so far is that if you had the current, uh, if you had the COVID vaccine, and we know that the, the, the South African strain and the Kent strain and the two Brazilian strains uh, which are available, which are around at the moment. And it is envisaged that the current uh, COVID vaccines would either protect or uh, dissipate uh, or reduce their effect um, if, if people had the vaccine. So I think that it's still, it's, still, it's still out, I would say, because these are very new uh, strains, which I think is part of why the government is trying to uh, put the red corridors and uh, stop a lot of people coming in from certain countries because of the uh, difficulty that might arrive uh, due to the strains. So um, I think it would at least uh, still do something, uh, if not prevent all the strains. Okay. Dr. Paul, do you want to have any follow-up? And at the same time, could you just debunk the myth about um, 
having mixed vaccines. So there's some questions about if I've had the Pfizer vaccine first, will I then be given another dose of another vaccine second? I think the government guidance is really clear about this, that you will have the same vaccine that you had the first time. Would you want to uh, elaborate on that, Dr. Paul? Can you unmute Dr. Paul? We still can't hear you. Thank you, finally. I've been trying to unmute myself for a long time now. <laughs> okay, um, can you hear me, Dr. Ndozi? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay, fine. So for the first question, I think the answer is that uh, the, the way the spike protein works is that, um, how do I give this as an example to you? Um, I think I'll probably repeat what I said to another group. It'll make probably more sense. Uh, so supposing I had a, a car myself, yeah? Imagine the spike protein as a car. The mutations that you're looking at is small changes within those key things, yeah? So for example, if, if my Honda car has got a change in the new headlight, it's got a new headlight, for example, it still is a Honda car, essentially. Does that make sense? So people will recognize that it's a Honda car. The bit that is worrying is that you know, the key bits of the protein that are crucial for the, for the virus to enter into the cells, what we call as the receptor binding protein, the RBP of the virus, uh, it, it should not undergo, if it undergoes mutation, it might affect the way, you know, the, the virus infects increasing the infectivity or the vaccine response and things like that. So far, whatever we have seen doesn't show us any worry for us to say that the vaccine will not be uh, totally unhelpful. The reason I say that is because the B cells and the T cells that Dr. Hugo mentioned about does not produce antibodies against only one bit of the spike protein. It's got multiple areas on the spike protein that antibodies are present against, if that makes sense. So uh, from basic principles from science, I can tell you that the vaccine will still be effective. The next question that people will say is, you can say that, but where is the data for that? When the vaccines that were produced initially, Moderna, and Pfizer, NB, uh, BioNTech, and the Oxford AstraZeneca were done, these variants were not there when those trials were there. So they could not capture the data. But similar technologies, so yesterday they announced that the Janssen vaccine that's now received the, the phase three data shows that it's effective against all these variants. Does that make sense? So what, what we can only imply now is that these vaccines will still be effective but the question is whether it will be the same uh, full protection it has got against the original virus that originated from, from, from China. What it will show is that there may be a slightly different uh, change to the variant, but not completely a, a total failure. It might be reduced by a few percentage and things like that. The second thing that I would insist here is to say that this new viruses, the new vaccines that are all being made, are all being made in such a way that unlike the flu jabs, like the old flu jabs and other things where you'll have to wait for a whole year to grow it again and change it, these are mRNA vaccines and they are synthetic vaccines, which means that they can be modified very quickly. If the WHO, the FDA, CDC, uh, MHRA, JCVI, ECDC, and all these big uh, international bodies find that the vaccine is because there is a constant post-vaccine surveillance going on, on real time. Every hour of the day, they're constantly looking at the genome sequences of the viruses to see whether those people who have taken the vaccine, who have taken treatment, who have died and all those things, are, are they changing in a way? And that's how we know those variants are there. So far, there isn't enough, um, uh, is it, there isn't any worry that these, this may cause some problem. The first variant that seems to have created this as a little bit of a concern is the variant from Brazil. Yeah, uh, and potentially the variant from South Africa. But what I can tell you for sure is that those people who have still taken those vaccines in, in those countries, for example, in Brazil and other things, have not gone on to fail the vaccine. They're still protected against it, which means that indirectly you know that the vaccines are working. The data itself is being collated, and I'm pretty sure that by springtime, there'll be enough data to say whether it is effective or not. But as stands today, we know that it, it's definitely effective is what I want people to take back. And the, the second question, Dr. Ndozi, was, uh, what is the second question? Um, 
I can't recall, but I think what I'll do is that there are lots of other questions. I can put another question to you. <laughs> if that's it. Um, it was another thing that I think they want real clarity on is about um, uh, sickle cell. I think we've answered that. And the overriding message was that if you have underlying illness, example, sickle cell, that you should still take the vaccine because yes. okay. if you have if you get COVID, because what the, the question that we're looking at, really, the real nub of it is that as an individual, if you get COVID, um, what happens to you versus as an individual, if you take the vaccine, what is what happens to you? And so if you take the vaccine, um, you're likely to have, even if you're infected as a, as a mild illness, as opposed to if you don't have the vaccine and you have underlying illness and you could have a severe, severe Ill, um, disease. Correct, absolutely. Yeah. So and that would be the, the message from all the, the medics on, on this call. Absolutely. Now, the, the other question that has come up is, the government started off by saying that we should have um, three weeks between the vaccine and they extended that to 12 weeks. And obviously that's caused some concern because this is the same um, individuals, they're not scientists, they're politicians that have made a decision which is different from the scientists. Um, GPs, how have you been explaining this and um, explain the rationale for this to your patients? Have any of your patients expressed concerns about the new directive? Deji, you wanna go first? <laughs> Deji's on you're, mute. You're mute. Yeah, th thank you, Ugo. Yeah, it's, it's a very difficult one, this, isn't it? Um, and, and we, we have seen, you know, I don't think there's, there's any right or wrong answer. Also, we, we've got the, the, the direction, the guideline from our government. Hopefully they've taken advice from, you know, their scientists, you know, to come to the conclusion that it's safe enough to have in 12 weeks. But what I have been saying to my patient is really, we have to look at it from two angles. One is a scientific side, you know, that what is the scientific evidence? The government are fairly satisfied that you get good protection from the initial vaccination. And that for uh, the Oxford vaccine, for example, you get increased protection if you wait uh, 12 weeks. And they think that, you know, you get enough protection with the Pfizer vaccine, you know, to have the initial vaccine and be delayed for 12 weeks. So that is the, you know, the baseline science that we have really. The second thing is the ethics of it, you know, the morality of it. You know, we are in the thick of a pandemic, people are dying. We've got limited supply of vaccine, you know, and, you know, the more we can get out there quicker, the more people we can get vaccinated. You know, common sense will say that we are likely to save more lives, you know. So, so I think that's, that's probably how they came to that conclusion, really, that, you know, let's get more people vaccinated, even though they're only going to have a partial immunity. You know, let's get it rolled out more quickly. Uh, and then we've got some evidence that, you know, people are getting in excess of like 70, 90 percent. So, so it makes sense to do this. And, and I think, and I agree with them because, you know, the evidence that we've seen so far, and this is all very anecdotal, you know, we are seeing patients are vaccinated. We are, you know, a lot of these patients are not developing COVID, uh, are not developing COVID and, and hopefully our figures will start to come down in the UK very soon. So, so we can only trust what they've told us so far. Uh, fingers crossed that the science is correct and, and that we, you know, we are doing the right thing. Thank you. I think the thing that sort of convinced me, because I must admit that I was um, had some concerns when they changed the advice from scientific to a, um, a sort of um, advice that was supposed to be population advice and not science. And um, what it was, and I think um, I listened to the COVID vaccines minister, and how he described it is that if you had a granny and a grandma, and you could protect each of them 70% each, or one of them 100% and the other one zero, what would you do? So whilst I had some misgivings, I understand the sort of, theirs is a population base to protect everybody as much as possible. You know, our NHS is enshrined in law that you must do your best to protect the whole of the community and not the fortunate few. It's, it's, it's a legality that the government have to protect as many people as they can. So I think that's why they, um, they, they went that way. One of the other questions that I know has come up is, is, is it safe? Because most vaccines are developed over a number of years and this has been developed in less than a year. So if it takes most vaccines quite a long time to be developed 
and this has been developed at speed, what, how will we show that it's safe? Dr. Paul, would you like to take that one? See nobody with their hands up. <laughs> well, okay, well, Quincy is answering that. Dr. Quincy. Can please, can you un unmute the doctors? Maybe you could just keep the doctors unmuted. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, my, my background before going into uh, medicine, I did a pharmaceutical chemistry degree. So I understand, I have a good understanding of uh, manuf uh, drug manufacturing and the process involved. Now, when it comes to vaccine, there, there's, there's, there are a lot of reasons why it takes so many years. So for example, the, the people making the vaccine will have to go and find funding. Uh, who's who's going to fund that uh, 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 um, research? When they jump the huddle of the funding, that might take about a year or 18 months. Then they will have to find, uh, apply for the ethics and approval to be able to do the research. That takes another year or so. And, and then they will go and look for recruits, people that will volunteer to be uh, for, the, for, the, for the drug trial. And once they've done that, they will manually or, uh, or regionally collate the, uh, uh, the data from their research. Once they've done that, that takes about a year or so or, or, or more, and then they will uh, analyze it, then send it to the drug approval agency. If it's America, it's FDA, it, 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 it's the, the, the FDA or MHRA for the UK. So then the, those approval agency will take time to get people on the committee who review the evidence. And uh, once they've done that, and they're not gonna review the evidence quickly, they will take time because there'll be other drugs that they will have to review as well. So it will take, take them another six months to review the evidence and then give their approval. So these are the steps that happens. Now, with COVID vaccine, all that, all that limiting factor, it, they, they, it, they had to find a solution to them. So for example, the, the government pumped in millions and millions of uh, uh, pounds and dollars in, into the research, uh, in, including uh, the, uh, the drug company. People volunteered very easily. The approval for, for, for ethics and research were uh, processed quite quickly. So, um, and the, when they start doing the trial, they were supplying the data live to the approval agency as they were doing the research. So they didn't have to wait. And the approval agency had to pr prioritize the approval of this vaccine because it's, it's become a national, a worldwide epidemic. So all that months and months and years of process we have done quite quickly. This, the second point was the, the, uh, the mRNA type vaccines. They, they can be easily, it's easy for them to, do, to, uh, to produce the mRNAs and it's easy for them to, to manipulate them. So it, it means that the process of producing the vaccine is a lot quicker. It doesn't mean it's less safe. In, in, in fact, when you look at the mRNA type ones, actually, they don't, they don't generate as much immune response because they, it's not a, uh, a live vaccine. And it, so I think Dr. Paul might be able to shed more, more, more light on that as well. So it, it means that they can manufacture this, uh, uh, these uh, vaccines quite quickly, quite efficiently. So with what Dr. Paul said before, when a new strain comes up, they can quickly tweak the, the mRNA to suit that virus and they can manufacture um, I mean, new one. So the safety is not being compromised because they produce the vaccines quickly. They were able to do it quickly because everything they needed to make the vaccine was in place already. That's why, that's what happened. Thank you. So it's almost like thinking about it, that if you have to get from point A to B and have to negotiate lots of traffic, but all of a sudden, if you have an MI, you get an ambulance and all the traffic lights are turned from red to green and everything, the way it's made open so you can get there in the quickest way possible. All the barriers that you would normally have in any trial were all removed because this was a global pandemic. 
the sense. Okay. Right, now there's a really there's a number of questions um, around that I'm going to go to now about the effect of healthy eating. So um, there, there's a view that if you look after yourself and you eat healthily, um, is is that enough to to sort of counter having a vaccine and to protect you from the side effects of of um, COVID? Can I can I take that? Um, Absolutely. Sorry, and um, the question of whether it's an alternative. I think that my 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 view has always been that they've always they're all parts of the same of the same coin, but it's not it's never a replacement for the vaccine. But we do know that healthy eating as a whole is always useful in terms of uh, every other, most other illnesses as well. And there are a lot of, uh, especially for those of us from the uh, uh, African background as well, where there's a lot of, um, in terms to do with uh, the kind of food that we eat and the herbs and all, uh, which people, some, some people, a lot of people believe in, you have to use plenty of garlic, you have plenty of ginger and all that. All that is all part of healthy eating, which is all great. And there's a lot of things on, um, on, 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 on the platforms and YouTube about uh, steaming, which is all to do with, it all boils down to water vapor anyway, when you, whatever you're uh, having in, in terms of steam. But they're all part of, uh, improving our immune system because there's a lot of antioxidants. There's a lot of things that have immunosuppressive effects and immunostimulating effects that we eat, but they are not really a, an alternative or a replacement uh, for having a vaccine, I should say. But I would say that they are very, very much definitely to be encouraged, uh, including vitamin D, which has also been uh, found to be a very important adjunct. I think Dr. Paul. Can I add to that one, uh, Dr. Ngozi? Yeah. Yes, of course you can. <clears throat> so the way I look at this, um, uh, healthy eating and um, appropriate uh, vitamin supplements where required and other things are very important. It's like asking me once again, I'm using the car again, whether you have to put the fuel in the car. Yes, you have to put the fuel in the car. Yes, you have to change the brake fluid. Yes, you have to do it. The question we're now talking about here is the protection from uh, a virus that we know definitely has infected at least 100 million people globally. And we know that there are some groups that have definitely been affected uh, much more severely in comparison to other groups. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, this virus seems to be affecting our older population, our immunosuppressed population, and some of the ethnic groups uh, across the globe. We have seen that it has affected the BAME groups very badly and, and other groups very, very badly. And the, the point is that this vaccine uh, has been now studied well enough. And now I know that in the UK itself, we have given the vaccine to about 8 million people. Uh, the US have given it to about 25 million people. The Israelis, about half the country's population have received it. Uh, Dubai has given it, the UAE has given it to about a quarter of the population. And even before all these things were done, and even before the phase three trials, the first and the most important thing we look at when you develop a new drug or a vaccine is the safety of that vaccine. Yeah. Dr. Can Mahal, a... Sorry, can I just interrupt? While you're doing that, can you just address the percentage of um, black people that were in some of these trials, if you know the percentages? Do you know the percentages that were in the Pfizer or the Oxford I'm, trial? I'm... I'm very not absolutely sure, but I'm pretty. I'm, I'm very sure that at least uh, five percent uh, to eight percent were belonging to the uh, groups that we are discussing about as well. Thank the you. reason is that the number of people that they were able to capture in the trials uh, involved people volunteering for this vaccine, and it so happened that there weren't enough uh, um, trial participants where they could wait and get uh, people from all racial groups to be included in that if that makes sense. But I'm pretty confident that the vaccine safety and the vaccine effectiveness doesn't stop after these trials. There are an ongoing post-vaccine surveillance going on through the yellow card scheme and the death mortality post-vaccine and things like that. So this, this data is going is being collected across the nations. And what we know is that 
the vaccine seems to uh, work exactly the same in all the populations. So there isn't any group uh, based on race, color, or uh, country, or age group, and things like that, where the vaccine is performing lesser than expected. It is, it is achieving the same, same way. So very quickly, I also wanted to address the issue about this uh, uh, two dose that uh, is contentious. But uh, I've read the available data so far. Um, and I'm sure if I'm going completely wrong, Dr. Ade or Dr. Miyade or uh, Dr. Uh, Gosi will stop me. The basic principle, the way that the human body responds is when you get an infection, uh, you respond by producing antibodies and producing cells across that, yeah? And the way the vaccines are produced is try to mimic that as much as possible, i.e. present something to the body, to the immune system, like a virus, but not a virus. Basically, that's what we're doing, isn't it? Yeah. 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 The, the studies have shown so far that people who have had one infection, whether it is an asymptomatic infection, a mild infection, or a severe infection, the protection from the body's T cells and the B cells and the uh, antibodies has consistently been that they are protective at least for a minimum of five to six months now. So what I'm trying to get at here is that even though we don't have the data that this works very well if you give it at 12 weeks versus four weeks or three weeks, the basic principle doesn't change us. The body's immune cells work in such a way that if an antibody is produced, those antibodies and those cells are protecting you at least for six months. Yeah. The, the reason that people are quoting that you should give it at three weeks and four weeks is because for Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, Oxford, all the vaccine companies were, were running against time, were racing against time. So they designed a, a random number to say, we will give a vaccine in such a way that we give the dose one on day zero and the second dose on day uh, three weeks later or four weeks later. And like uh, my colleagues were mentioning before, if this is not a pandemic, we would have probably said, I want to check what happens if I give the vaccine at one month interval, two month interval, three month interval, or six month interval, or one year interval. We just didn't have the time. So yes, the data currently says that the protection that's offered is at three to four weeks. But we are all, we are all unlike the, the Spanish flu or the Hong Kong flu when 100 years ago they didn't have the technology or the understanding that we have today. We know that the human body, once it gets those antibodies, will be present at least for three to six months. If that makes sense. So it's not like a cliff edge. When you develop antibodies at three weeks, you don't suddenly, all the antibodies disappear and you die. No, it doesn't happen that way. There is a very slow and steady fall in the amount of antibodies and that goes right up to six months. So I think it's reasonable. I've, I've listened to many immunologists, many vaccinologists, many virologists uh, from Oxford, Edinburgh, and Cambridge. And consistently, they've all said that absence of data doesn't mean that the body will suddenly say at three weeks or four weeks, oh, I'm going to be no, not protective anymore. Does it make sense? So I completely, I, I think that this is one of those things where I would probably put my bet because if I had my grandmother and grandfather allow here, and I had to choose between giving the vaccine to both, but wait for three months later. The key bit is people are forgetting that we are not saying, not me, sorry, the government is not saying that they don't get the second dose. They're saying that they'll get a delayed second dose. So instead of getting it at one month, they're getting it at the end of three months, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah? I think it's so, really clear when you put it like that, when you have to choose between two people. When people think exactly. about my family members, you think my grandmother and my grandfather, do I protect yeah. both of them? or do I protect only one of them? Yes. And it does make it a bit clearer, yeah. So now, the the question, of... just before you go, go on, you might be able to answer this while you're talking. If people have said, I've had COVID, so that means I've got antibodies, do I still need to take the vaccine? So the answer to that question is that uh, the reason why we know that we have to keep taking the flu vaccines every year again and again is because COVID belongs to the coronavirus family, which, which as a virus group, is a respiratory virus and all the respiratory viruses keep visiting us every year. So respiratory viruses, including flu and COVID in the future will be like Christmas. They will keep coming back every year again and again. So just because you've had the disease or the vaccine one dose, it doesn't mean that you can stop and say, I've had mine. No, you will have to. They're still looking at whether the, sec the subsequent doses will be 
uh, every nine months or every 12 months or every 18 months or every two years, something so that. But we have got some time to go for that. The answer is that by taking a vaccine, even if you have had the COVID disease, is not going to be bad for you because it will mount, if anything, it will increase or enhance your immune response within the body. So that's Thank what you. I would say. Yeah. So the, the answer to some of the questions, is this going to be a regular thing? Um, it probably will be, just like how the flu vaccine is a yearly vaccine. Now, there were some other questions about um, the contents of the vaccine. I think this bothers a lot of people and concerns a lot of people. And um, <clears throat> luciferase is used in the vaccine. And what's the luciferase used for? I think that that's a concern. And mm -hmm. also the proteins that are in the vaccine. There, there is a, a lot of people who do feel that once these proteins are put into your body that you will be able to um, track people. And that's not far-fetched in a sense. I think people, there are lots of things that people worry about. Who would have thought 20 years ago that I would be able to say where everybody in my family was via their phone? It sounded like science fiction, I think. So it would be helpful to address the luciferase and the contents of the vaccine. Um, and also about the proteins and if that's going to, have to be able to monitor people. So my answer to that second bit is very simple. There is enough technology today available for people uh, to track me uh, through you know, CCTVs or through other technologies using my face recognition. They don't need to put a chip inside me to track me if they want to track me is the first thing. Uh, and I don't believe that because there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that mRNA or any other components of this vaccine can be used for trackability. Luciferase is not used in any of the vaccines. And I don't know where this came from, but luciferase is an enzyme that's used for some diagnostics in a research laboratory. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, Dr. Um, um, uh, Quincy might, might know more about this, but we never use it in any vaccines. We never use it in any treatment. And luciferase as a term, I presume is, uh, is uh, causing some bother because of the name attached to that. But luciferase is another enzyme that's used for some diagnostic tests in the research laboratory, not for any routine vaccines or treatment. And the next thing is in terms of the actual constituents of the vaccine, I can tell you that there is some amount of sugar in it, sucrose, there is some amount of uh, salt in it, so sodium is there. And there is some amount of the uh, uh, polyethylene glycol, PEG or polysorbate. These are products that are used to make sure that the vaccines don't get contaminated. So they're basically sterilizing bits, which will keep the vaccine safe without allowing anything else to contaminate it. And depending on whether it is an Ox, Oxford, AstraZeneca or uh, uh, Pfizer, if the Pfizer BioNTech has got what's called as the lipid nanoparticle. So lipid nanoparticles are basically steroid uh, fat molecules that are derived from plants, essentially. And what is unique about them is that uh, if you put any other uh, uh, any other fat uh, lipid product into the blood, they will be immediately destroyed. These particular lipid nanoparticles are unique because they can stay in the blood, human blood uh, or in the human body without being destroyed rapidly, which means that they can be safely able to take those mRNA uh, into the cells where it is meant to go and replicate to produce the pr proteins. That makes sense, yeah? Yeah. Whereas the Chedox one is an adenovirus, which all of us have at different time points of our life, yeah? And this particular adenovirus is actually not even human adenovirus. It's a virus that is probably known to infect chimpanzees, but this has now been taken out from that. They have been made completely weakened, this, this viruses, and grown on human cells, on human uh, kidney cells, actually, in the laboratory. And once they are grown there, their cells are completely destroyed, yeah. And only the pure virus, which is completely weakened, is engineered to introduce the same mRNA into them. So there is absolutely no uh, kind of uh, pork gelatin. There is absolutely no mercury or there is no uh, egg protein attached to that. The three common things that always causes concern. Uh, I can definitely tell you that there is no luciferase involved. I can confidently tell you that there is no, um, no other products that uh, other than what is being exposed into that one. So... These products are always made in such a way that 
you have to so today in the market if you go on to any place you will find that every product you take and you buy for yourself and you look in the back side you will find that there are other contents in the back every single product that we buy will say we have added this to make this one we have added this salt to make this one we have added this particular you know coloring agent for this purpose we have added this one so what i'm trying to get at is that there is even more closer scrutiny into what goes into a vaccine or into a medicine that is used compared to the lots of things that we don't hesitate to think about so the new cream that i brought the other day uh, i brought it to my house and i was looking at it the number of excipients and other things added to that is not something that i question but i believe that you know that it is safe for me to use so the answer is that uh, the people who have developed this one have looked at all the things and they are safe to use and th- these are the basic products that these vaccines contain thank you thank you now i'm going to go to the gps because the other thing is um about the number of deaths so for people who aren't in healthcare who haven't been at the front line and been treating some people it's actually quite difficult to conceptualize an extra 100,000 deaths so i want you to tell us your experiences about um the excess deaths that we're seeing and the other question is to relate that to other communities if you can because the some questions i think quite valid that in new zealand we've seen the photographs of new zealand how they were at a concert they haven't had any vaccination program how have they been able to do it and people have visited other countries other black countries and it doesn't seem to have the same number of covid um, affected patients people in the caribbean in parts of africa so two things one about your experience and your um your view of the number of deaths and comorbidities in your experience as doctors because i think you're in a position of privilege to say exactly what's happening that other people might might not see and the other thing is about other communities so i'm going to start with deji oh well, th- thank you for that angosi thank you um i mean sadly this is the biggest uh, battle that we, we have faced you know in, in all our lifetime i would think you know covid uh, infection the, the numbers are, are horrible in this country when you, when you think about 100,000 people we've lost um that's bigger than the size of like you know some towns and villages in the uk uh, and these numbers are real, you know, we are seeing it, you know, as, as a family doctor, unfortunately, we are receiving notifications, we are watching patients that are dying from COVID, so, so these numbers are real, um, and in our experience, we know, you know, the number of patients we tend to lose on a regular basis before the pandemic, so we can see now on a daily basis that we are losing more and more patients, um, so if there's anybody out there who's, who's thinking, you know, Maybe this is a myth or it's not happening. You know, we can we can tell them these are facts. You know, these numbers are real. Um, in terms of you know why we haven't Sorry, seen. Just, just interrupt you while you're saying. I've also heard that they, that some people believe that they're putting COVID on the death certificate when they may have died from other reasons, and that's why the number of COVID deaths are as many as they are. Could could you address that? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, the way they have been reporting the, you know, the numbers really is if you've got, you know, if you people have had confirmed COVID infection in the last 28 days, um, I think, you know, if you think of it, you know, we, we have got people that have got, you know, other comorbidities or, or maybe, are, you know, poorly in one way or the other, and then they now have COVID and they died, you know, so you can safely say COVID has contributed to their death. So, so the government uh, statistics is, is fairly accurate. It's, it's a good way of doing it. Um, because in my personal experience in the practice, for example, I have patients that have, got, you know, that have had like strokes or people that have got dementia and things, and they've been living with these conditions for years. You know, and then unfortunately they develop COVID and they end up dying within a very short period. So you know, we can safely say that it's COVID that has killed that person. Um, and then regarding the second question about why COVID is not as, uh, you know, the numbers are not as high in some countries. Um, personally, I, I, do, I don't know why, because I mean, my native country, Nigeria, I think a few of us are from Nigeria, you know, people are saying the numbers are, you know, are quite low in Nigeria and a lot of other countries. Is it because they haven't got good data? Is it because the population are a lot younger? You know, so, so there's a lot of things and, and that I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure why the numbers are low in certain countries. New Zealand, you mentioned, and Australia, uh, we know that they've been quite strict about, you know, 
about their lockdowns, about allowing people from overseas to enter their countries. So undoubtedly that will have contributed to why they've got very low numbers in Australia and New Zealand. Okay, thank you. If I may add, yeah, to add to I that. just add to that, um, just in addition to what uh, Deji has said there. Now, the funny thing about Africa as well is that in Southern Africa, the numbers are so high compared to just a couple of thousand miles west or north. Um, countries like South Africa have got very, very high death rate, again, with predominantly a uh, black population. And in comparison to West Africa, where the number, even though data is low, um, like Deji was saying, whether that has to do with the age group, um, it's, there are some aspects of this, which is really still very uh, difficult to discern, especially when the same thing is happening in certain parts of USA and there are a lot of black people are dying there with the same genetic stock. And in, uh, is it the sun? Is it the vitamin D? Um, we don't know, but in my practice uh, locally, and I, I would say definitely that the numbers are going up and we are seeing them, especially people in the nursing homes who are picking up COVID, and then you sometimes you see a whole nursing home the, uh, going into quarantine because uh, everybody there have picked up COVID, and then then I'm getting patients saying, "Well, okay, there's a hearse the other day, and they don't know who's died because they are not even being allowed to see their neighbors." And so definitely, the numbers are uh, are going up in in, in practice. Thank you. Uh, Quincy, would you like to add to that? Just, uh, yes, just to add just a few points really in, 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 in addition to what I've said, just to clarify, a doctor, as a doctor, you cannot issue a death certificate if you cannot justify why a patient has died. So you can't, it, 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 it's statistically impossible that the whole doctors in the UK will collude to uh, put COVID as a cause of death. For, uh, for, for every patient that had died, because it, you, ethically, you have to put what you feel is the most appropriate cause of death. So just to, to try and address that, that concept, the, the issue about uh, Africa, there's a lot. So if you look at the healthcare infrastructure in, in Africa compared to the developed world, it's completely different. People, will have to pay for the care. People will pay for the testing. People will, uh, if, you, if you are, if you, for, for example, in Nigeria, if, you, if they know you have COVID, uh, your business, everything is getting shut down. So people don't want to come out and get tested. They, they, people um, are not, it's, it, the, the, it sort of seems to be like a taboo that you've got COVID and everybody will avoid you. So there, there is that stigma attached to it. So it's quite challenging to know what the data is. Coming back to the point about the UK and the excess death, we know that every year we, there's a, a, a data of number of people that die each year. And the data, the deaths being reported is really in, in, in excess of that yearly uh, and seasonal fluctuation that we see over the years. So, the other point is, if you look at this year, a lot of people wouldn't, didn't die from flu like in previous years because of the social distancing. Uh, the spread of flu is really, really small compared to what we used to see in previous years. So, so again, the death rate from that is less. But when you look at the numbers, I think for it's really important that the, 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 we have a lot of conspiracy theories and it spreads quite easily. And people just throw things out there with a little bit of truth, but they bend the narrative completely and make it something else. So the COVID death rate is real. From my personal perspective, I think the, the, the consequence of surviving COVID is actually worse than dying from the COVID. The, 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 the impact that that has on individual, it's pretty, pretty high. 
and that's not being reported. So all in all, uh, it is real. There's no, the doctors are not colluding. There's no conspiracy theory from my perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're about to come to the end of the session and I'm going to say thank you for everybody who has um, joined today. I think um, reading through the chat, I think there's, this again was just to pr provide some information for everybody really. And I, I hope we've um, been able to do that in a considered way. I know that there are still a lot of questions and concerns and I am sensitive to the questions and concerns. I'm sorry that we weren't able to answer all the questions, but as the count team have said, they will collate the questions and the ones that we haven't been able to answer, they will give you a response. Um, lastly, I would like to say that we should continue to remain safe. Even when you get the vaccine, the, the, the um, advice is to still continue to remain safe. Um, about the numbers, I work in frontline medical care. I look after newborn babies. So I've seen directly the impact this has had on my colleagues who have had to be deployed to look after adults. As a paediatrician, we're having to look after adults in ITU. That is very, very um, traumatic for us because we've never looked after adults, not to talk of very sick adults as well. But the numbers are real because what they have is a baseline. So to put it mildly, if 100 people die a year, this year, many more are dying because they have a baseline that they collect every year. So thank you um, very much for joining us. I'm going to hand over to the Khan team um, to give a roundup. Thank you, Lucy. It was very useful. And yeah, thank you to all our cool. panelists. Yeah. Thank you. Charles. Yeah, so we, we, we just want to thank, you know, our doctors for making their, you know, for making themselves available. Yeah, I know there are still lots of concerns and some of these are historic, you know, to the way we destroy the system, which is fair enough. But as we've said, and, you know, our remit and, and our role and the very objective for which Khan was set up is to work with our community to eradicate health inequalities. These are there, you know, these people and ourselves, nobody's given us a pound to set this up, but we know the underlying health conditions. We know some of the, you know, maternal mortality data and some of the other issues that, you know, we face as a community. So it's for us all to be responsible Yes, we know what no one size fits all. We are not against nutrition and healthy eating. They will help some people, that will help some people, but will not help everyone. So please, these sessions are for you as an individual, knowing your personal circumstances to make an informed decision and let us look after ourselves. And, you know, I'm sure we will help a number of people stay alive through during these difficult times. So thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.